welcome to episode number eight of Christianity, Cults, and False Religions. Uh, today uh, should be the day right before Thanksgiving, or maybe you're watching it sometime afterwards. And episode number eight, we're going to uh, look at Hinduism. Hinduism. And Hinduism may be something that you're not really familiar with, or you, you know a little bit about, uh, about, but you've never really pinpointed it. And honestly, as, as I was preparing for this, and just from my own past personal experiences, Hinduism m may be the most difficult to pinpoint and to educate on because there are so many sects of it, and there are so many different beliefs about it. Uh, there's Brahmanism, there's Hare Krishna, there's Transcendental Meditation, uh, there's even uh, even uh, the Rajneeshas, which are well documented and known here in Oregon, I, I think maybe in the uh, 70s or 80s, um, uh, you know, that would be an offshoot of, of Hinduism. And so today, I mean, I can't cover all of those and all the details of them, so I'm going to really try to hit the, the major points, the main points concerning uh, concerning Hinduism and the way that it plays out most here in uh, America. Uh, as of the latest poll, there are no less than 10 million Americans who take part in some form of Eastern mysticism, uh, which Hinduism would play into. Uh, 500,000 of those would consider themselves Hindus. Uh, approximately 13% of the world's population, because this is popular in Asia, India specifically, which has a large um, uh, concentrated population. So 13% of the world population would claim to be Hindi, would claim to be of the Hindu religion. Um, and, and today, in America, the primary stepping stones into the religion of Hinduism are really two avenues. One is yoga. And that may surprise some of you, um, but that is true. That's one of the things that they use to introduce people into Hinduism. The second one is transcendental meditation. And so it's really interesting that those two things have very easily made its way into mainstream uh, culture here in America, yoga and meditation, uh, because they're actually tools of Hinduism uh, and uh, to to really introduce people into the ideas of their religion. Uh, and by the way, there are over a million Americans Americans who regularly practice one of the two. Uh, and then now, actually, that's probably way more than that than when this poll was taken. Um, part of the reason that Hinduism as well is so hard to pinpoint is because there really is no definitive founder or date of origin or anything like that. Um, sometime between 1500 BC and 500 BC there were records of Vedic or Vedic texts that became the the uh, the key writings for Hinduism. These were known as Vedas or Vedas, the Hindu scripture. Uh, they, they mainly described the duties of their priests and the rituals that they were supposed to partake in. Um, and so those just kind of got passed down as, as they were written. But again, it's really, really difficult to pinpoint when it started, how it started, who started, all of those kinds of things. It's, it's just uh, uh, really difficult to do. Um, there are a number of gods within Hinduism um, however, uh, there are three main ones. Brahma, which we had obviously understand, um, that's, uh, we have bulls and animals, cows, and are named after that. And if you go to India, they, the, the cows are sacred, and this is part of the reason why. Uh, Vishna and Siva, and each one plays a different part. Um, but around 1000 BC, the Brahmins, those that worship the god Brahma, uh, they emerged as the leaders within India um, and, and within this Hindu religion. And around that same time, they began to institute a caste system in India, which is actually still at play today. And just to give you a basic idea of what a caste system is, it's a it's a societal structure that is based on your birth. You are slotted in a place in society for your entire life based on how you were born. So in other words, this is the way it works. If you were born poor, you will never be able to rise above that in the caste system. If you were born uneducated, you will never be able to get an education in that caste system. If you were born as 
and, and elite, then that's you know that's where you'll be. But there was you were already slotted by your birth. There was no opportunity to better yourself or to get ahead of those kinds of things. And so that's just kind of the way it was. The Brahmins obviously were the elite class, and would begin to abuse that power over people and control over people. Uh, as you could imagine, as a result of this caste system, there was a revolt um, that uh, that actually birthed another religion that we're going to look at next week, uh, uh, that is Buddhism. Buddhism actually came about as a revolt against the caste system of Hinduism. Um, and so... Uh, as as some of these thought processes came to America and really collided with the countercultural movement of the 1960s, um, uh, Hinduism found its way into America primarily via two avenues, uh, as followers of Hare Krishna or Transcendental Meditation. Um, and I'm just going to be honest here, a man with a name too complicated for me to even attempt to pronounce who went by the title His Divine Grace, was the head of what is known as the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. That's the beginnings of the Hare Krishna uh, sect of Hinduism. The primary message was that in order to obtain inner peace, a person must empty themselves of the concerns of this material life and give themselves over to the devotional exercises uh, a, a devotional exercise to the of, of the God and to the God uh, to the Hindu Hindu God uh, Krishna and I'm going to tell you who Krishna is here in a minute because you said wait a second it's Brahma Vishnu and, and Siva we'll, we'll get there here in just a second uh, one of the primary ways that a person would empty themselves of this material life was through uh, the practice of yoga specifically a, a part of yoga known as as bhakti um, and so they believed that. This released a person from the law of karma. Karma is something that really that started here uh, with Hinduism. It releases them from karma and the cycle of or, or, of, of reincarnation. And so, um, you may also see these people, these Hare Krishna people, with with beads, with strings of beads that look very similar, maybe to the Catholic uh, Rosary. Uh, they chant mantras that they're expected to chant seventeen uh, times a day with these beads in their hands. Uh, many of these people will withdraw from society and they'll li live in communal settings. Um, they'll sell literature and other things as, as a way to raise money for, for His Divine Grace. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. Uh, as for Transcendental Meditation, um, a man by the name of uh, Maharishi Manesh Yoga was a prominent guru, guru in the 1960s who taught his followers Transcendental Meditation, which basically is, is a technique where people are taught to concentrate on an object, to use controlled breathing, and then to utter certain mantras while they're doing those things, really with the goal of emptying their mind and, and reaching an altered state of consciousness. Um... And so those are kind of the, the two basic ones we're going to look at, Hare Krishna and, and Transcendental Meditation. For both of them, as far as who God is, um, the gods in the Hindu religion, there are three main ones again, Brahma was the creator, uh, Vishnu is the preserver, and Siva is the destroyer. And so Vishnu, that middle one, the preserver, was supposedly incarnated or reincarnated nine different times, sometimes as an animal, sometimes as an avatar, which is a god in the human, uh, in human body. That's why in Hinduism you'll see uh, different animal gods and idols that they have because that's a reincarnation of, of, um, of Vishnu. One of those reincarnations, the eighth reincarnation of Vishnu, was, uh, Vish, uh, uh, of, uh, Vishnu was a man by the name of Krishna. And Krishna, the man, grew and evolved within this religion and finally became what is known as the great Vishnu. Now, with, with the growth from Krishna to the great Vishnu, with this expansion, that is where Hinduism says that creation came from. When he expanded to the great Vishnu, it resulted in the creation of the universe and all of the people in it. And so Vishnu is really kind of this creator, and even though Brahma, they say, is 
uh, is the creator. Here they say Vishnu kind of brought everything into being at this moment. Now for transcendental meditation, it's completely different. God is just a, 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 as, as a creative intelligence. And again, that's why Hinduism is so difficult. There's so many sects of it. There's so many different beliefs. There's so many different gods. There's so many different thoughts about it. It's really, really difficult to pinpoint Hinduism. And so I just shared Hare Krishna with you and trained in meditation, and their thoughts about God are completely different. Um, for the Hindus, their view of Jesus is that he was a a holy man who communicated truth, but he was not God. Uh, he, he also was not perfect. Uh, they believe that he committed a sin uh, when he got angry at the, at, at the money changers in the temple. Uh, they also believe that he did not suffer on the cross because he had attained enlightenment, which allowed him to move beyond physical pain. So while he was not God and he was not perfect, Throughout his life, he did enough things to obtain, obtain enlightenment, which allowed him to escape the realities of pain in this life um, and all of those things. However, you know, the Bible says in Isaiah 53 and verse 6, speaking of Jesus, says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. In, in Matthew chapter uh, 16 and verse 21, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And so Jesus said, I'm going to suffer. It's going to be painful. Um, as far as Jesus' sinlessness, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest, which should not be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Uh, it also says in, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate, uh, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. In verse 28 it goes on and says, For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. Uh, he, is, he is without sin, unlike us. Um, when it, when it comes to how a person is saved, uh, Hinduism teaches that when a person dies, they are reborn or reincarnated. This is reincarnation. And, uh, and they continue that next life as an animal or possibly as a, a human. And so they have this consistent cycle of, of birth, uh, death, reincarnation and basically you stay on this cycle until you can attain the the level of deity um it, the only thing is if you continue on the cycle but you just get more and more evil at some point they'll you'll just be destroyed uh, annihilated and so basically each successive life that you live is either a reward or a penalty for the life you're living right now uh, and so that is, that's the law of karma. That's where karma comes from. They say, hey, you know, what you do right now, you're going to be paid for it in the next life. It's either going to be good or bad. That's the, that's the law of karma. It's a reward for the good life that you live now or the suffering for an evil life that you live now. Uh, for, for the Hindu, there are really three uh, main ways that a person can be saved. Yes, three. There is the way of works, there's the way of knowledge, and then there's the way of devotion. For the wealthy people, they usually follow the, the way of works. Um, and that just requires a certain amount of offerings and observances of rituals and duties that obviously wealthy people could just pay to do and have the time to do. It's no big deal. Uh, the way of knowledge is the way of meditation. Okay, uh, And so that goal is to correct a man's error of his thinking. Uh, and, and the error is that he thinks, man thinks he's distinct or separate from, uh, from everything else in the universe. But he must learn. Meditation is, is used to teach man that he is actually in a union with, uh, with everything else. He is one with everything else. According to Transcendental Meditation, salvation is realizing your union with the creative intelligence, with God. Um, and so... The way of devotion, that's the way that, that's that's the way of knowledge, is a way of works, okay, that's that's offerings and duties and rites and rituals. Uh, the way of knowledge is meditation. Then there's the way of devotion, and that is the way that most poor people try to attain salvation within Hinduism. And it's also the, the primarily the one that is promoted by the Hare Krishnas. And that is devotion 
to Krishna. That, that's, that is the way of works. And so it's based on love, and it's expressed by acts, both public and private um, uh, worship, uh, and, and uh, both to Krishna, but also in your loving human relationships. And basically they say this, if, if you allow your life and your, your love for Hare Krishna and your love for other people and human relationships, if it's controlled by, by passion, then you, I'm sorry, let me back up. If it's controlled by ignorance, then you'll go to hell. You'll be, you'll go to hell. Um, if, if it's controlled by passion, then you'll continue in this cycle of birth and death and reincarnation. But if it's controlled by devotion, and that's devotion to Krishna, then you can escape the wheel of reincarnation, the wheel of karma, and have a future life in the spiritual realm. You know, the Bible deals with this idea of, of karma and reincarnation uh, quite pointedly in Romans chapter 9 and verse 20, 27. It says, and it is appointed unto men once to die, once to die. Let me say it again, once to die, but after this, the judgment. Um, and the Bible makes that pretty clear. It's not time and time again, over and over again. Um, I also want to say this about meditation. Uh, one thing about meditation, those that practice transcendental meditation uh, believe really that man has not sinned against God, but that he's become separated from God, not because of his sin, but because of his ignorance. So, so man has either forgotten or has lost the awareness of the fact that he himself is, is part of God. Um, and and uh, so salvation is achieved by reaching a state of bliss consciousness uh, through transcendental meditation that'll free you from pain uh, and, uh, and peel you away from this endless cycle of, of reincarnation. Um, now, the Bible talks about meditation, but I want, I want to address this because the Bible type of meditation is very different than the type of meditation that's dealt here with, with transcendental meditation and people who, who in, in our culture that use it, and certainly from Hinduism. Uh, you know, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8 says, this, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. If you read uh, the, the, the Psalms over and over again, the idea of meditation is there. However, when the Bible uses meditation, it is not this 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 inward rise of feelings and this inward rise of consciousness. Instead, it's, it's an expression of faith in and worship of the Lord. That's really what it is. It, it's grounded in the Bible. Meditate on the Word of God, on the book of the, of the law. It's grounded in the Bible and it's focused on Christ. So I say that because when we talk about meditation, there's a difference of biblical meditation and what the world refers to as meditation. I want to warn you, Christians should be careful about just opening their minds to anything and not resisting any thought. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. It says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, notice this. Both in, in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, it tells us that we meditate on, on the word of God. Why? Uh, so that we can observe to do all that is uh, according to all that is written therein. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15, when it says, cast down imagination uh, and every high thing, and to bring into captivity every thought, notice was to the obedience of God. Christ. Our meditation should not open us up to any, anything and everything. Our meditation should focus our hearts and minds on obedience to him. Now, in closing, Hinduism has a great emphasis on relativism. Obviously, I mean, this is God, that's God, this is a way of salvation, that's the way of... I mean, it just, it's just all over the place. So everything is, is relative. There are no absolute truths. Truth, uh, truths. They will say that all religions are the custodians of the truth. But the Bible says in Psalm 119 and verse 30, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. In, in John chapter 1 and verse 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace 
and truth came by Jesus Christ. I want to make one thing clear. The Bible very clearly tells us there's a way of truth, and that way of truth comes by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I hope today's study on Hinduism has shed some light on that and been helpful to you. Hope you have a great rest of the week, and we'll talk to you later.